Okay, let us resume with our fourth lecture. And let us start by uh, recalling that by the end of the previous lecture, uh, we were considering the problem associated with the decouple system, the gauff kodatsi decoupled constraint equations. In the case of vacuum and with the CMC condition, uh, implying that the mean curvature in this case uh, was, was zero since we are considering asymptotically Euclidean manifolds. And we were trying to consider problems associated with black hole boundary conditions. In particular, we provided uh, here an upper and horizon boundary condition and a marginal sharp boundary condition. This first one we translated into this kind of boundary condition for the associated vacuum the generic equation. And this second one got translated into a condition on the traceless part of the extrinsic curvature that basically had uh, this form. And here we're rewriting uh, in, in terms uh, of the vector field X associated with the conformal decomposition. And notice that since we are in vacuum and uh, with a CMC condition, so this is a homogeneous equation here, uh, this is already a, a TT tensor because the, the conformally uh, derivative is traceless and the divergence is this conformal killing Laplacian. So this is already the TT tensor that uh, appears in the decomposition of K tilde. Uh, so we are taking this kind of uh, prescription for K tilde. And therefore the idea is that we are rewriting uh, this boundary condition associated with the marginally trapped boundary condition in this form where alpha now is taken to be a one form defined in a neighborhood of our boundary, which we choose so as to have a zero a projection on, on the normal direction, uh, to have a non-positive projection in the normal direction. So uh, when we apply here this to a new hat, uh, the same will happen here, uh, and we, we will get this sign. Uh, uh, notice that this sign is conformal uh, invariant, so we can put a, a hat here. Uh, okay, so, so our system on asymptotically Euclidean manifolds in the case of vacuum with this kind of black hole boundary conditions got translated into this system here. We reviewed the tools associated with the conformal uh, method, uh, the maximum principles, and the monotone iteration scheme and also the mapping properties associated with these linear operators appearing here. And then the idea is to, to solve the decoupled momentum constraint as we did in the case of uh, closed manifolds, then X becomes a, a datum. We can construct our K tilde TT tensor. We replace it here, and then we, we have to, to devote the rest of the analysis to the associated generic equation, okay? Uh, finding a positive solution, following the conventions associated with the conformal method, then uh, this prescription gives us a solution to the gauff kodatsi constraint equations, recalling that we are in the CMC case and asymptotically Euclidean. So since the mean curvature should decay to zero at infinity, it implies that it has to be zero. And satisfying uh, these black hole uh, boundary conditions. Okay, and this would provide us with appropriate black hole initial data for, for the evolution problem. And uh, similarly to the case on closed manifolds, the analysis for the uh, momentum constraint is quite straightforward and only depends on the linear properties associated to the, the linear map appearing in this equation. And basically the, the, the result is summarized in this lemma. So if we have a, an asymptotically Euclidean manifold with compact boundary or the regularity that we've been working with, and the parameter delta, the weighting parameter here is always going to be considering this appropriate interval where our operators had good mapping properties. Uh, and if we assume that either gamma possesses no conformal killing fields or that we are a little bit more regular and recalling that this condition implies the absence of conformal killing fields in these spaces, uh, then uh, we, we set the one from alpha to be a uh, a prescribed datum uh, in W2P log defined in the neighborhood of the, uh, of the boundary. Uh, then uh, the, the, the momentum constraint that we are analyzing here has a, a, a unique solution, uh, X in this space. Uh, 
and it follows directly from the mapping properties associated with what we call the, 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 here the map P2, that is basically the map that considers this operator here. Uh, from the linear properties, we know that uh, this map is going to be an isomorphism under our hypothesis since its kernel is the set of, com of conformal killing fields in this space. So we, we are excluding this possibility from our hypothesis. Uh, then since uh, alpha uh, has trace in, in this space, we know that uh, this map P2 is an isomorphism from W2P delta into LP delta minus two times uh, this sovelet space uh, W1 minus one over P, P uh, on the boundary. Uh, and therefore we have a unique solution associated to, to our choice of alpha here. Therefore now uh, what we need to do is to, to concentrate on the analysis of the Lynch Neuroix equation. And we know from the monotone iteration scheme that we described in the previous lecture that what we actually need to do is to produce uh, barriers associated with our Lynch Neuroix equation and they apl apply the monotone iteration scheme. And we shall now present a barrier construction that is due to David Maxwell and in particular applies uh, to the Yamabe positive case. And just as we saw in the case of closed manifolds, the Yamabe class of our metric is going to play a central role. And we first have to extend the definition of the Yamabe invariant to this case as asymptotically Euclidean manifolds with the boundary. So in particular, in this case, one has to add this term that uh, relates to the mean curvature of the boundary. And then we, one can extend the definition of the Yamabe invariant to this asymptotically Euclidean uh, setting. This is in particular also a conformal invariant. And the Yamabe properties and Yamabe classifications have been studied in this context of asymptotically Euclidean manifolds, in particular in these two pa papers by David Maxwell. The first one this is the one that we are following for this presentation right now, where certain deformation properties associated to the Yamabe classification when asymptotically Euclidean manifolds with boundary were established. And also in this paper by, by Dils and Maxwell, uh, a complete Yamabe classification in the case of asymptotically Euclidean manifolds without boundary uh, has been provided. And in particular, we have the following uh, fundamental result for us. So under our setting, um, we have a, a, an asymptotically Euclidean manifold of this level of regularity. The weight parameter is in the right interval. Then the following three conditions become equivalent. The first one is that there is a conformal deformation, which is asymptotic to, to one at infinity, uh, such that the, the, the metric here, uh, gamma prime, that is the conformally deformed metric, is scalar flat and has minimal surface boundary. It's equivalent to Yamabe positivity. And in particular, these conditions are equivalent also to the fact that uh, these maps, this family, this one parameter family of maps, uh, depending on, on this parameter eta uh, for each eta in zero one, uh, define isomorphisms for each value of, of the parameter. And these are basically a, a, a variation of the uh, conformal Laplacian uh, and the boundary operator associated to it in the mean curvature prescription problem here. Uh, and so, these three conditions become equivalent and this will be important for us both in this lecture and the next one. And the first result here is a, a more or less straightforward corollary of this last uh, proposition that is also due to David Maxwell. And it says that, well, if we, are, we have an asymptotically clear manifold with the same hypothesis above, then Yamabe positivity implies that there is a conformal deformation asymptotic to one at, at infinity uh, that uh, brings scalar curvature to zero and has negative mean curvature on the boundary. So uh, the above equivalence guaranteed that the, the boundary could be brought to, to, to zero mean curvature. Now the idea is that we can put negative mean curvature on the boundary. And the idea is uh, for the proof is that we can start assuming that the scalar curvature is zero and the boundary has a zero mean curvature. Since if this uh, was not the case, uh, we could uh, first use a conformal deformation to bring our metric to this hypothesis. And then we would start from there looking for a second conformal transformation, achieving the, 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 
the claims of the corollary, and then the composition of both conformal transformations would be the one that we are looking for. So we can start assuming these two conditions. And clearly this preserves due to conformal invariance GMO positivity. And now we look for a conformal deformation asymptotic to one, preserving a zero scalar curvature and putting a negative mean curvature on the bone. Using the conformal properties associated to the scalar curvature, this is well known uh, from previous lectures and also uh, the, the conformal transformation for the mean curvature associated to, to this metric gamma, gamma primed. Uh, this can be a straightforward exercise to, to compute. Since we are assuming that these two terms are zero, we see that we are looking for a positive solution to this system. This first equation would imply that this is zero and therefore the deformation goes to zero scalar curvature. And the second uh, relation would imply that this is negative and so we are deforming to negative mean curvature. In order to solve this uh, boundary value problem, the idea is we can fix some small value of epsilon. In fact, we can consider uh, a one parameter family of equations for epsilon small. Uh, and look for solutions to these boundary value problems. Uh, we look for solutions that decay to infinity in these spaces. We know from the mapping properties associated to this linear operator that we saw in the previous lecture, that this operator is an isomorphism. So for each value of epsilon, we have a unique solution. In particular, this implies that when epsilon is zero, we have the unique solution given by uh, this curly phi equal to zero. Uh, and furthermore, if we use this continuous embedding associated to our functional spaces and there were hypotheses, uh, and we appeal to elliptic estimates, one can uh, see that these uh, functions uh, phi epsilon, uh, they depend continuously on epsilon in this C0 uh, weighted topology. And since we just saw that uh, the phi zero solution is equal to zero, then we know that for a small epsilon, the solutions are going to be close to zero because uh, of, of this statement here. And therefore, in particular, we know that these uh, phi epsilon uh, functions are going to be strictly positive for such small values of, of epsilon. If we apply our uh, operators on this uh, phi epsilon, the Laplacian is going to kill the constant and then it's going to give us just the Laplacian of this curly phi epsilon. And it's the same here with the normal derivative. And therefore we see that this phi epsilon solves the same boundary value problem here, but it's now a positive function asymptotic to one. And in particular, it serves as an appropriate conformal factor which satisfies all of our claims since this being a solution to this problem guarantees the two properties that we are looking for. Now, uh, let us go to the uh, main existence results also due to David Maxwell. And the idea is that if we start with an asymptotic Euclidean manifolds under our assumptions, and we assume that we are EMA positive, and we start assuming that our scalar curvature is exactly zero, our mean curvature is non-positive, and we give our uh, TT tensor uh, K tilde that has been constructed as a solution of the momentum constraint already. Uh, and we assume that this is a W1P delta minus one TT tensor. Then if we impose this relation between the mean curvature and these normal components of the uh, TT tensor along the boundary, uh, we can solve the associated Lichnerovic equation. Uh, and just let us note, notice that uh, this would be uh, a link between three parameters of the problem. We will discuss a little bit about these conditions uh, in a minute. So uh, adding this condition for now, uh, we have a solution asymptotic to one, uh, and therefore following the prescription of the conformal problem and remembering that we are in the case where two is equal to zero. Uh, this pair here solves the vacuum constraint equations with boundary conditions satisfying this black hole condition. Let us sketch the proof. 
uh, we know that what we need to do is to exhibit barriers, uh, and then we apply the monotone iteration scheme. And since we are starting with the assumption that we have zero scalar curvature, then our system doesn't have this, uh, our equation doesn't have this, uh, this term, and it becomes uh, this boundary value problem. Okay? The idea of, of writing this uh, in this way, in the right hand side, is that our condition that we imposed uh, as an additional condition in the hypothesis of the, of the theorem implies that if we take phi equal to one, then we get a, the, the right sign on, on, the, on the right hand side so that uh, this is a, a constant subsolution to our equation. And therefore, we need to find a, a, a positive uh, a super solution that is uh, greater than one. Uh, and in order to do this, let us consider the family, the one parameter family of uh, boundary value problems given by, by this problem. Uh, where we are introducing again this parameter eta, uh, and it lives in this interval uh, zero one closed. And from again the mapping properties associated uh, to, to to this linear operator, uh, we know that we have uh, unique solutions for each value of, of eta in this in these spaces. Uh, this uh, condition here comes from the hypothesis uh, that this is non non positive. Uh, and now the, the idea uh, is that if we consider this uh, phi eta being this constant one plus this curly phi that uh, eta that arose as a solution of the above boundary value problem, then uh, it is straightforward. If we apply it here, then the Laplacian kills the constant part. And if we apply it here, it, the same happens with this part, but we can put together these two terms so as to form uh, this other term here. And therefore, uh, this function solve this boundary uh, value problem. And the objective for us uh, would be to prove that uh, phi one is greater than zero. Uh, but since from our hypothesis, we could have a mean curvature uh, negative, uh, then we cannot apply the maximum principle directly in order to extract a, a, a sign on, the, on, this, uh, on this function. Here, the idea is a little bit more subtle, and it is described in detail in the, in the lecture notes and also in David Malcolm's paper. But here we would just uh, sketch it. The idea is that what one can actually do is to appeal to the maximum principles to show that a uh, phi sub zero is positive, because in that case, this term is not present. One uses the, the, the weak maximum principle to show that it has to be uh, no negative, uh, uh, and then since this tends to, to one uh, at infinity, it cannot actually uh, be identically zero and the strong maximum principle implies it has to be positive. And then one has to apply a connectivity argument to show that the, the, the subset of values eta in zero one for which the functions phi eta are positive actually equals the whole interval. This is through a a connectivity argument uh, that is quite standard in these kind of settings that can be checked in the lecture notes. So one can push this positivity claim up to phi one. So substituting here phi one, uh, one now gets that phi one satisfies this identity from the first equation with this sign. Uh, uh, and in the case of the, of the second equation, now one knows that this is a positive and this is not negative. So one also gets a sign here. Uh, so this in place now through the weak maximum principle that this curly phi one is non negative. Therefore, this phi one that is this curly phi one plus one, this is greater or equal than one. Uh, so it, 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 it can be a, a tentative super solution. And in fact, if one uh, tries uh, to check this, uh, one sees that since this is greater or equal than one, then this inequality holds. Uh, and furthermore, uh, since uh, the, the, the same kind of, of, of result holds uh, for, for the boundary condition, uh, here we have to, to recall that we have constructed the, the K tilde tensor so as to be uh, when projected on the on the normal components, uh, it is non non positive, so uh, this would decrease this this term. 
at least not increase it. So we get the right inequalities to guarantee uh, that phi plus is a, is a super solution that is above our constant uh, subsolution. And therefore we have contracted appropriate barriers for our, our Lichirix equation. We can apply the monotone iteration scheme and uh, we can guarantee the existence of solutions. Let us just, just comment briefly on the hypothesis of the theorem because we started assuming this, uh, this kind of condition, but notice that if we are Yamab positive, then if necessary, due to the previous corollary prior to the theorem, we know that we have a conformal deformation that brings uh, our scalar curvature to zero and our mean curvature to, to a strictly negative value. Uh, and furthermore, once we, we go to this conformally related uh, metric, uh, one can solve uh, this uh, boundary value problem, for instance, by fixing our one form alpha to be of this form. It's just a, a, a function uh, in the normal direction. This would be the normal uh, one form associated uh, metrically to the normal vector. Uh, and, and we take this function to be uh, defined in the neighborhood of the boundary to be a W1 B log function uh, satisfying along the boundary uh, this condition. We, we can fix, the, fix this uh, after we fix uh, our mean curvature to, to, to be a negative value. We can fix this function H arbitrarily uh, within this interval. And we fix this one form here, we plug it into the momentum constraint, we find a solution. And then uh, when one computes a K tilde using the solution that we have just constructed, uh, that is our K tilde is defined uh, in this way. So it's just plugging here the normal vector and the same here and the same here. Uh, we see that this will be above uh, our mean curvature and will be satisfying uh, this condition. And therefore, uh, we have constructed from just by starting with something that is Yamabe positive, we can go to a conformally related uh, metric that satisfies all of the conditions of the above theorem. And therefore, from, from there, we start and we apply uh, the, the barrier construction, the monotone iteration scheme, and we find solutions just by starting with something that is Yamabe positive. And furthermore, there is a conformal covariance property that can be checked in the lecture notes, which allows us to produce solutions starting either with, with the first original Yamabe positive solution or with the conformally related one. And both solutions uh, are going to give us the same geometric physical solution to the gauss codatz constraints. Uh, and so everything uh, works nicely. And in particular, in the case that we don't have boundary, uh, the same results above apply, but just neglecting the boundary uh, contributions. And in this case, we have a uniqueness result of the same sort that we uh, discussed in the case of, uh, of closed manifolds by the end of the first lecture, of the second lecture. Uh, and the proof is quite similar, but now appealing to certain uh, weighted spaces and it is uh, completely detailed in the case uh, in the lecture notes. Uh, so the, the idea is that we, we have the same kind of, of, of results having either a uniqueness or a strong uh, rigidity uh, where, where two solutions have to be positive proportional so the coefficients have to vanish. Uh, and in this case, we get the IMAB positivity condition. Uh, so with this, we have uh, finished the, uh, this part of the analysis of uh, black hole boundary condition, black, black hole initial data under CNC assumptions on asymptotically Euclidean manifolds. We will return in the next lecture to asymptotically Euclidean manifolds, but dealing with a, a fully covered system and also with, with uh, the possibility of, of sources, physical sources. And now what we want to do is to start our uh, analysis of far from CMC solutions. So we will go back to the case of closed manifolds and start presenting some classical results, uh, classical, uh, although these are quite recent, uh, some results uh, that pioneered in this arena of uh, far from CMC solutions. And if, let us, uh, I start just by commenting that from our previous lectures, we can see that the conformal method 
uh, is quite effective when dealing with the uh, with, with CMC conditions. We, we treated the vacuum case explicitly, and in the lecture notes you can see similar results. Uh, in the case we have sources, but they allow us to decouple the, the, the constraints. But outside the CMC context, the conformal method has proven to be less effective. Uh, one can, for instance, when we have a near CMC condition, appeal to certain implicit function techniques uh, to find uh, solutions that are, uh, are, uh, are, are close to, to being CMC. And so one first fixes a CMC solution, and then one appeals this uh, implicit function techniques to, to, to show there is a neighborhood of the solution where one can uniquely solve uh, the problem. So you have some kind of local uniqueness uh, results uh, for near CMC data around a known CMC solution. This is uh, done explicitly, for instance, in the intellectual notes for closed manifolds and with some sources allowed. Uh, but results for freely prescribed being curvature have proven to be much more delicate. And uh, for instance, uh, something that it is known is that uh, in contrast to the above theorem that we showed about uniqueness uh, and the previous one that we had proven uh, concerning uniqueness of closed manifolds, uh, outside the CMC case, uh, uniqueness results ha ha are known to fail. Uh, and this has drawn some attention to certain modifications of the conformal method. Uh, and this is a whole topic on its own, uh, since if one wants, for instance, to use the conformal method in order to have a, a, a good method for parametrizing the, 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 the solutions of the IC constraint equations, this uniqueness property is going to be important. And therefore, some modifications have been proposed and uh, analysis has started in that, that direction. But nevertheless, some advances, some recent advances uh, have been obtained. And we highlight the following two papers. The first one that pioneered in this direction is this paper uh, that treated the case of uh, solutions on closed manifolds without the near CMC condition. And uh, then uh, a related paper also here by David Maxwell that's a complemented the bad paper treating also freely prescribed mean curvature uh, solutions uh, in some complementing cases, in particular, this treats the, the, the vacuum case that was left outside of the previous paper. Uh, but well, uh, not surprisingly, this new freedom typically comes at the expense of having to, to impose certain smallness condition on other parameters of the problems. Uh, for instance, if we are in vacuum, we are going to have to impose certain smallest conditions, for instance, in the, in the TT parts of the uh, Kate Hilda tensor. We will now explain uh, the results of this paper as an introduction to this far from CMC constructions. And then we will, uh, in the next lecture, go to, to a, a, an even uh, more, uh, more coupled system, uh, uh, strongly a coupled system. Uh, and we shall follow uh, this paper in particular because it is uh, much closer to the kind of results that we have been developing through these uh, lecture notes. So it's going to be easier for, for us to present these results than uh, the one by uh, Michael Holtz and collaborators, okay? So in order to fix ideas, let us fix a three-dimensional manifold and we will uh, consider the vacuum case and this dimensional restriction will be lifted in the next lecture as well. Uh, so we, we, we are considering this coupled system on a closed manifold, uh, recalling that K tilde has this definition, so this is the, the K tilde, uh, on, on a three-dimensional manifold. And let us first start by characterizing the solutions of the Lichnowitz equation. This is related to things that we did in, in, the, in previous lectures. Uh, and uh, recall that we have this characterization uh, result for, for on closed manifolds. So if we have a closed manifold, now we are going to demand a little bit more of regularity. Typically, we were working with this kind of condition. Now we are going to be working with this condition, and below we will explain why. So if we start with this kind of uh, closed manifold, then we know that uh, this equation, uh, the Lichnowitz equation, with a uh, tau and k tilde fixed in this space W1p, admits a positive solution if and only if one of these four conditions is satisfied. 
here we are, we are using the one of the conditions that we knew that was a, a necessary and sufficient condition in the Yamabe negative case. And this case that is in red here won't be important for us because this is a CMC case. So this has been dealt previously. And we are just going to, to be interested in the first three cases that uh, allow for, uh, for the mean curvature to be non-constant. So we have here a complete classification of, of, of the properties that we need for the, uh, our conformal data in order to have solutions. Uh, good. Uh, and in the first three cases, the solution is unique. This is something that we also uh, know from previous lectures. And the last case where, it, where, where some kind of non-uniqueness can exist, we are not going to consider because it's a CMC case. Uh, and the condition here demanding more regularity that we were used to uh, arises because later on we will require some pointwise control over the uh, this k tilde uh, tensor, uh, and this condition allows us to to do that because uh, if p is greater than than, than n, then uh, on the one hand this space becomes an algebra under multiplication. And on the other hand, this space gets embedded into the space of continuous uh, functions. And therefore, for instance, we can provide this kind of estimates. Uh, due to the algebra property, we can provide this kind of estimates. Here, by this, what, what we mean is that the implicit constants in the middle depend on fixed parameters of the problem, so they are not important for us. Uh, and furthermore, uh, this is an, then using the definition of k-tilde, uh, having these two different components, we get this estimate. Uh, and this is related to the first derivative of X. So this can be estimated by uh, the W2P norm of, of X. And something similar uh, uh, happens here uh, where we are actually using this uh, embedding result. Uh, and, and then we are using similar estimates. And what is important in these estimates uh, is that when this norm appears here, uh, and this is fixed because it's part of the conformal data. Uh, if X arises as a solution of the momentum constraints, then one can use elliptic estimates to estimate these in terms of the uh, data in the momentum constraints, in terms of the mean curvature, and, uh, uh, and in fact, of, of some barrier constructions that we will provide. So uh, that is uh, the important thing that when, when X is constructed in this way, uh, the above uh, can be estimated appealing to elliptic estimates associated uh, to the conformal Laplace, to the conformal killing Laplace. And the above theorem uh, actually uh, gives us this kind of characterization for the solution map associated to the Lichinerovitz equation. So if we start with conformal data, uh, excluding this possibility because it's uh, CMC, uh, we can think about the domain uh, where we can associate to each uh, trace, uh, to, to each uh, traceless symmetric uh, tensor, a unique solution to the Lichinovitz equation. We denote this by uh, L1, this map. Uh, so it is assigning, as we are saying, uh, to each symmetric uh, traceless tensor, a unique solution. Uh, uh, we would like to, to, to characterize this domain. And one sees that this uh, theorem does a complete characterization here. Uh, in particular, what, what it uh, tells us is that if we are in this case of Yamabe non-negativity, then we just have to exclude the, the origin. And we have to impose that this tensor is not exactly zero. And uh, in these cases, we, we have a solution, a unique solution. So we, this map is well-defined outside of the origin. And in the case of Yamabe negativity, we have uh, the, the exact condition that we need. We, we need that if Yamabe uh, is, is negative, then there, there, there has to exist a conformal deformation satisfying this property. And in, in this case, the, the, the domain of here is the complete uh, space W1P of symmetric traceless tensor of this. Uh, good. And from the only if parts, it is, these are actually the, the, the maximal domains of definition of this map. 
And this motivates the following definition. We will say that uh, gamma uh, uh, and tau above are Lichnowitz compatible if they satisfy one of the hypotheses of the theorem uh, above. So if they satisfy one of these kind of hypotheses, one to three, uh, given here. So in this case, if gamma and tau satisfy fall into one of these cases, we say that they are compatible. And if K tilde, uh, in this case, a, a symmetric traceless tensor field, satisfies the corresponding condition, we say that K tilde is, is admissible, okay? Uh, and so when we are dealing with compatible data and admissible data, uh, then uh, they belong to the domain of definition of this mapping. This is the important thing. Now, no, notice that if we fix our conformal data here in this basis, we are assuming this uh, condition. Uh, and we assume that the gamma does not have any conformal killing fields. And we also talked about this. We know that this is a generic condition. So unless we are in a very special situation, this will hold. Then given a, 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 any positive element of L infinity, we are going to denote the positive elements in L infinity by this L infinity plus. The momentum constraint is uniquely solvable because we know that its kernel was uh, consisted on the conformal killing fields and we are assuming that we don't have any. And therefore associated to each uh, function in L infinity plus, if we plug it into the right-hand side of the momentum constraint, let us just uh, recall it here. If we plug the function here, we will be able to, to, to give a, a related unique solution to, to this problem. And this is what we are saying here. Uh, good. And this map uh, is well defined due to uh, our discussion. Uh, since under this functional hypothesis, the right-hand side is in LP, uh, uh, and this becomes an isomorphism. Uh, now, the uh, idea is to, to show that the image of this map falls into the domain of the solution map associated to the Lichnowitz equation. So the strategy is that if this happens, one could start with some L infinity function that is positive. One puts that into the right-hand side of the momentum constraint. One associates a unique solution X to this uh, function. One puts this into the Lichnowitz equation. If one is in the domain where we have a, a, a solution that we just characterized above, one can get another function, uh, another positive function there. And one could start an iteration procedure and look for, for instance, a fixed point to this uh, uh, kind of problem. And any fixed point would be a, a, a solution to the system. So this is a strategy that's going to be adopted here. So what we want to, to, to characterize is this condition, in fact, that the image of this solution map associated with the momentum constraint falls into the domain of the solution map associated with the Lichnowitz equation. So if we start assuming that we do not have any conformal killing fields, we assume that the data are Lichnowitz compatible and that our TT part is admissible. So this is a symmetric traceless uh, tensor field. And we assume that this is an admissible uh, symmetric traceless tensor field, which actually means that this is uh, happening, for instance, in the case of EMAB positivity, because EMAB non-negativity. Okay. Uh, well, in these cases, uh, we can get this, this conclusion. And uh, also that given, well, uh, any element in L infinity here, we can first associate the, this symmetric traceless tensor field. And this is going to be Lichnowitz admissible, proving this, uh, this condition here. This first part follows from our discussion above, since we don't have any conformal killing fields. The map L2 is defined on all of L infinity plus, and therefore the momentum constraint has a unique solution, and we can define this K tilde tensor here uh, for, for all these elements. Now, if we are Yamabe negative, uh, since we are assuming that gamma and two are Lichnowitz compatible, uh, then this is going to be Lichnowitz admissible uh, because in, in this case, when these two things are Lichnowitz compatible, uh, it means from our definition here, uh, it means that this conformal deformation uh, exists. And in this case, uh, the, the domain is the whole W1P space. 
So we just need to worry about the case for we are Yamabe non negative. And here we are going to use the fact that U is admissible by hypothesis implying this condition. Uh, and then since K tilde consists of, of, on these two parts, which are easily seen to be L2 orthogonal, one can see that uh, this norm is going to consist on the norm of this part plus the norm of this part, the L2 norms of each part. Uh, since this part is going to be non-negative, non, non we have this lower bound. So since this is not exactly zero, this is clearly positive, implying that this is non-zero. And therefore, it's literally submissive. So what we have seen is that we can compose both maps under the, hy the hypothesis of the bar proposition. Okay, so if we don't have conformal killing fields, our conformal data are literally admissible uh, and compatible, then we can compose both solution maps here. Uh, and this composition is well defined. So as we said before, the fixed points of this map are going to be in one to one correspondence with the solutions of our system. And what we know, want to do now is to be able to, to guarantee the existence of fixed points. And for that, the, the idea proposed by David Maxwell was that uh, to, to apply to this well-known theorem by, by uh, Schauder. Uh, the idea is if you have a, a, a closed convex set in a Banach space that is invariant by, by some mapping here, and this mapping is continuous, and the image of this mapping is compact, the closure of the image of this mapping is, is compact, uh, then the, the, this map has a fixed point. So one wants to, to apply this. So one needs to first build a closed convex subset in L infinity plus, that is the, the domain of our, our map, and which is invariant by the action of our map N, defined above. Then we need to prove that this is continuous and we need to prove also this, uh, this compactness property for, for, for the map. Concerning the, the first point, one should uh, take into account, account a few remarks. When we analyzed the decoupled Schrodinger's equation, we saw that the existence of barriers uh, allowed us to, to build solutions that were trapped in, in, in an interval of this kind. An interval of this kind just means that uh, we have a, and infinity functions that satisfy these properties, okay? Uh, but in order to find a, a, a similar kind of subset that is invariant for our solutions of the Lichnerovic equation, uh, we need to, to improve our notions or to strengthen our notions of barriers because the invariance property here associated to the Lichnerovic equation when it's, it was uh, decoupled, uh, relied on, on these endpoints being sub and super solutions, and the sub and super solutions depending on the coefficients of the of the equation. But the equation, coefficients of the equations depend on, on this k tilde that is constructed from a function that is in this interval, and therefore something here can become circular. And in order to avoid that, one needs a kind of a barrier that is in some sense uniform for any function that is in this interval. Uh, uh, any function in this interval constructed as a solution of the moment of constraint. And this is the definition of global barriers that is presented here. So basically a global super solution and a global uh, sub solution, in this case, uh, the super solution is going to be a, a super solution that works for any, any coefficient here, uh, K tilde, that has been constructed as a solution of the momentum constraint where the source was below the super solution. Uh, and the global subsolution is going to be defined with the opposite inequality in this, in the, in this uh, same manner. So uh, it's going to be a, a subsolution that works for any k tilde here constructed from an x that, that comes from the momentum constraint as a solution uh, with the right hand side having uh, here phi uh, bind, bounded by below by this subsolution. So, these are the notions of global barriers. And now we, we attempt to find uh, an invariant subset for the application of the Schauder fixed point theorem of this form, but where now the barriers are global barriers, okay? And let us highlight that this kind of subset would automatically be closed in an infinity and convex. Uh, and so what we need to then do is to establish uh, the invariance of, of 
our mapping on this uh, kind of subset and all, also the continuity of our mapping and the compactness property. And the construction of these sets uh, relies on a few lemmas. The, the first one is this one that basically uh, says that uh, one can find, uh, we saw in previous lectures that one can actually, uh, one has this conformal covariance property uh, when one can go to a, a preferred conformal, conformally related element where uh, finding solutions is easier. Well, here is the same, but with barriers. What we are saying is that we have a barriers associated to the Lichnerovic equation, if and only if the conformally related Lichnerovic equation also possesses a, a, a sub-solution or a super-solution. Uh, and this follows by direct computation using the, this kind of conformal uh, covariance properties. Uh, this is detailed in the lecture notes, but follows by a straightforward computation. So, so the point here is one can, can choose a preferred Conformal, conformally related data for which the construction of the barriers can become easier. Uh, then the idea is also to, to, to present this lemma that helps us uh, make barriers compatible. So the idea is that if we consider the Lichnerovic equation with fixed uh, conformal data two and k tilde, uh, if we have a super solution, then any function of this form with alpha greater or equal than one, uh, is also a super solution. And similarly, if we have a sub solution, then any function of this form with alpha between zero and one is also going to be a sub solution. And this again follows by straightforward computation. And we leave this as exercise that can also be consulted in the lecture notes. Uh, and the next lemma that is uh, important is this one, which guarantees that, in fact, any pair of barriers for the Lichnerovic equation with fixed k tilde. Uh, provides us with a bound for the solution of the Lichnerovic equation for that k, k tilde. So uh, given a closed manifold uh, under our neuroregulatory assumptions, uh, if we fix the conformal data two and k tilde, and we suppose that these are uh, compatible and k it's admissible, uh, then given a super solution, uh, that it could be any super solution, then the solution associated to k tilde from the Lichnerovic equation due to the compatibility and admissibility conditions is going to be below our super solution, regardless of which is our super solution. And, similar, and the similar result holds for the sub solution is going to be above an arbitrary sub solution. Uh, and the proof goes like this the idea is that uh, since we have compatible conformal data and admissible k tilde, uh, we know that the Lichnerovic equation admits a compatible pair of sub and super solutions that we denote by phi bar. This comes from our previous lectures. And we know that we have a, a unique solution associated to, to this conformal data that we construct from the monotone iteration scheme from these barriers. Uh, now, for instance, fix the sub solution and using a constant that is sufficiently small and the previous lemma here. One can transform this phi bar minus into a sub solution compatible with the super solution that is assumed to, to, to exist in this lemma. Uh, and therefore, one can apply again the monotone iteration scheme, but now with these two barriers, with uh, this phi prime and phi plus, and find a, a solution associated to the same conformal data that lies between these two uh, barriers. But we know that the solution associated to this conformal data is unique uh, due to our previous discussions. And therefore we, we see that this phi prime has to be equal to the solution associated to k tilde. And so our solution associated to k tilde is below our super solution, regardless of, of, who, uh, of, of, of this super solution, how it was constructed. It doesn't need to be this one for us. And the claim for the subsolution follows along the same lines and the details can be found in the lecture notes. Uh, now, uh, a corollary uh, here is that if one considers the same setting as above with a, a compatible conformal data and admissible uh, TT tensor, then if one has a global super solution, then this global super solution uh, gives us this bound uh, for uh, it gives us, I'm sorry, uh, this bound for any solution 
constructed starting with something that is below the super solution, okay? So a global super solution gives us this bound for any solution that is constructed from the composed mapping here, uh, starting in the momentum constraint with the right hand side with something that is below the super solution. Uh, and, and now th this is quite straightforward. We, we know that under these conditions due to the compatibility and visibility, this map N is well defined over all of an infinity. And if one considers one element here in an infinity to start uh, our process, uh, one associates this phi bar as the solution, uh, where this is constructed from the momentum constraint. Uh, and since this is a, a global super solution uh, for a, 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 and this phi is supposed to be below the super solution, from the definition of the global super solution, we know that phi plus is in particular a super solution of this equation. Then the previous lemma guarantees that the resulting solution here, phi bar, has to be below phi plus, okay? Uh, and the next step now is to, so, so we know that this provides us a, a, a bound from above, and the next step is to, to guarantee uh, the existence of a, of a global lower bound. Uh, and this is more delicate. The idea here is, again, uh, under these same conditions, assuming that we have a compatible data and admissible CT tensor, and we assume that we have a, a global super solution then the idea is that there is a constant such that uh, for any element that we start our process that is uh, below the super solution, it follows that the, so the, the, the solution associated to this element phi is above this positive constant. And uh, here the, the, the proof depends on whether we are in the EMAB non-negative or the EMAB negative case. This case is more subtle. And the idea is that one starts with some element in L infinity, one associates the solution of the uh, momentum equation uh, and then one considers the associated Lichnerovic equation with this fixed here. Uh, the objective is to show that this admits a, a, a subsolution, which is bounded from below by this uh, k zero, and that this constant is independent of our choice of uh, phi zero. Once this is established due to our previous uh, results, we know that this subsolution bounds uh, the, the solution of, of, of this process because any arbitrary subsolution would do that. Uh, and establishing this lower uh, bound is quite delicate. One first goes to a conformally related family where uh, constructing the barriers, uh, the subsolution is easier. Uh, uh, and the last construction, this last construction is quite delicate and, and de depends on, on delicate estimates, for instance, that are related with a lower bound of the green function uh, associated to this operator. All this can be consulted in David Maxwell's paper and is explained in the lecture notes. But well, the EMA negative case is more direct, since in this case, being this uh, data compatible, then we know that we have a conformal deformation that satisfies this scalar curvature condition, uh, which implies basically that this deformation theta satisfies this equation here. Uh, but then for any element L infinity uh, that we use to construct the solution of the momentum constraint, uh, one sees directly, this is going to be zero because of the conformal deformation, that one, the, the, the Lichnerovic equation here is equal to this, uh, and this has to be non-positive, non and therefore just picking our sub-solution sub, sub here equal to this conformal deformation theta, uh, this works for any finite infinity that we may uh, start and with which we, we may construct this coefficient. Uh, and therefore setting then k0 equal to the minimum of this function that we know to be a continuous positive function. Uh, again, uh, we have this estimate recording that any subsolution provides a lower bound from the previous lemma. Good. So now uh, let us, we, we have actually constructed our invariant subset. If we have a, 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 our closed manifold, we have our conformal data, we assume that they are compatible and admissible. Uh, and we have a, sub, a, a global super solution now. Uh, we know that this global super solution from previous lemmas is going to bound uh, solutions that's, uh, is going to bound uh, our map from, from, from above, from any phi that starts below it. And we know that from the previous result, we can construct a sub solution that gives us this constant case zero that uh, bounds from below uh, any solution uh, that we may construct from, from some finite infinity plus. So this 
uh, this subset uh, becomes uh, invariant under the action of n. And now we just have to check the, the last two properties. We need to, to, to show uh, that this map n is continuous and that this is subset is compact. And under the hypothesis of the above uh, corollary here, uh, this is that this is continuous can be seen as follows. We know that our map n is the composition of these two maps, where the first one is actually the, the inverse of the conformal killing Laplacian, which is under our hypothesis a continuous isomorphism. So we just need to worry about this map, uh, this one here. And the idea is, well, let us fix some element in its domain, and analyze continuity at that, at that point. And the first idea is to use conformal covariance. We know that if we have a solution associated to this element k tilde sub zero, uh, then we can consider conformally related data. And we know that for this conformally related data, we also have to have a, a, a unique solution due to conformal covariance. That this, is, this equation has to admit a unique solution. This is what we are saying here. And in this case, we denote by L1 prime the solution map. Now, also, we know how the two solution maps are related. It's by, by this relation here. And if one here were to, to uh, consider uh, this case zero knots, one uh, would immediately see that the corresponding solution uh, at k0 and phi0 is this one. It's one. Uh, okay, this comes from here. For k0 knots, this would be equal to, to phi, phi knots, and one gets this conclusion. And now continuity of the original map L1 uh, at K0, uh, it's equal to continuity of this map at this point. And that is what we're going to prove. The idea to analyze the continuity of this map at this point is to rewrite this implicitly in operator form here. So the above can be rewritten, the, the equation associated to this conformal problem here. Uh, where this uh, psi, big psi, is given by this expression. Uh, and we know that psi uh, at the zero value, uh, we have a solution. And it is, it is easy to see that this is a, one, a C1 fresh map uh, between the above function spaces. And further map for that the linearization with respect to, to phi here, evaluated at this solution that we have just commented uh, here above, this solution. Uh, it's an isomorphism, and this uh, comes from a standard elliptic theory. And therefore, uh, we can apply the implicit function theorem to guarantee the existence of a, of a neighborhood in W1P and a neighborhood in W2P of K0 prime and one, respectively, and a map that takes uh, this kind of symmetric uh, traceless tensor fields to, to this kind of, of, of functions here. Uh, uh, and gives us solutions in a neighborhood of, of, of these points. And the implicit function theorem guarantees that this map is C1 due to this C1 property here. But now due to uniqueness of solutions to this problem under our conditions, we know that this map provided by the implicit function theorem uh, is the same uh, as our solution uh, L1 prime. And this implies that uh, our solution is actually, this map is actually C1, not just continuous in a neighborhood of K0 tilde. And therefore it is in particular continuous. And therefore for, from what we, we saw here, we know that the original map is continuous at K0 that was an arbitrary point in the domain. So we have start, uh, established continuity. And in order to start to establish the pre-compactness property of our map, uh, this follows from elliptic estimates. So uh, under the same hypothesis above, we are going to uh, claim that this is uh, compact. And if one uses the elliptic estimates associated with this linear operator, one finds that the solution given by this map is going to satisfy this elliptic estimate, where this is the right-hand side of the Lichnowitz equation, uh, this here. Uh, one can apply the existence of our super solution that guarantees both an upper and lower bound for, for phi, as we saw here, in order to get a lower bound, in order to get a, a uh, an upper bound depending on, on, on whether the powers are positive or, or negative. And then one was to est estimate uh, this in terms of the super solution. And in order to do that, one appeals to the kind of estimates that we presented previously. One knows that these estimates follow 
we had already presented this one. And since X comes as a solution of the momentum constraint, one you can estimate this in terms of the right-hand side of the momentum constraint. And appealing to the super solution, one gets a uniform estimate in terms of the conformal data and the super solution. Uh, and therefore putting everything here together, we see that this is uh, bounded uh, uniformly in this uh, space. And this inclusion is known to be compact and therefore it follows that uh, this subset has to be compact in infinity. Uh, therefore we have established all the conditions needed in the fixed point theorem. Uh, and therefore we, we have this existence theorem uh, under our conditions that we have our conformal problem coupled in this case, we have uh, to assume these uh, these conditions here that are the ones that are related to admissibility and compatibility of the conformal data, and therefore, if we have a, a global super solution, then the, the system admits a, a solution uh, to the coupled problem appealing the above results. Uh, in this setting, one again uh, is reducing everything to, to finding an appropriate global super solution. And we are just going to end by commenting. We are not going to do the construction. These super solutions can be delicate to find. But uh, for instance, in this paper, several constructions for global variables have been provided. In particular, one can find a Yamabe positive global super solution uh, where the construction allows for freely prescribed mean curvature. So we can prescribe arbitrary uh, large and, and, and fluctuating uh, mean curvature. Uh, so we, we get far from CMC solutions appealing to the above theorem together with this kind of construction from hosts and collaborators. And also in this paper, one can find uh, many constructions uh, of barriers that ap uh, apply to the other EMAB classes, but sometimes invo uh, invoking a near CMC assumption in the construction. And these kind of tools have been translated to to many scenarios, for instance, having included some York scale, York scale sources in this paper, uh, also scalar fields in this paper by Bruno Permoselli, and also in this paper by Katarina Valcou. Uh, and they translate to boundary value problems, for instance, in this paper here, and to asymptotically Euclidean on manifolds, these techniques can be translated. So we will stop here uh, after having explained these far from CMC constructions in this setting, and we will resume in the last lecture presenting results which are far from CMC for the electromagnetic constraint system, which is a larger constraint system since we saw, as we saw in the first two lectures.